pleasure to see all of you here. Thank you for coming out and joining us this evening. I'm Les Adler, the Dean of the School of Extended Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, those of you who are regulars at Sonoma State, and those of you from the community who've joined us this evening. This is a very special event, an evening with Dr. Molefi Kiti Asante. This is part of a major initiative here at Sonoma State University to enhance global and international education. Uh, it's a recognition on the part of the campus, and perhaps it's a long overdue one, that a big part of our mission here is to bring the world to our students, and wherever possible to bring our students out into the world and make a connection happen. The mission statement of a new global and international studies committee here on campus speaks of the vital need to advance the exchange of perspectives, skills, knowledge, and understanding between cultures. And I think that's the purpose of this evening's talk, and I think it will be a wonderful evening for all of us. Before turning the podium over to our introducing who, who, the person who will introduce our speaker and the speaker, I want to thank several people and acknowledge a number of people who've made this evening possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Miriam Hutchins. Miriam, where are you? At the back of the room. Miriam is the director of the North Bay International Studies. She's the same height when she's... <laughs> Miriam's the same height standing or sitting. It's... <laughs> Miriam is the director of the North Bay International Studies Project, which has been a leader in bringing international education to Sonoma State and through Sonoma State for many years. I also want to thank the Napa Valley Unified School District that has helped fund this event and make this evening possible. I would like to thank members, many of them are here this evening from the Global and International Education Committee, which is headed by Dr. Carol Blackshear Belay. Um, who are engaged in the process of enhancing global education in every way possible here at Sonoma State. I'd also like to acknowledge the existence and thank the support of Phi Beta Delta, which is a new international honors education society that has just opened a chapter here at Sonoma State. I would also like to thank the School of Education and its staff, in particular Joni Boucher, who's standing at the back, who has done another wonderful job in coordinating this evening's event. A couple other announcements, and then I will get out of the way here this evening. One is that after the lecture and a brief question and answer period, there is going to be a reception. There are refreshments. It will be held in the room next door. You're welcome to join us and stay as long as the refreshments last, which I hope is a long time. Otherwise, we have a lot of brownies we have to take back. Um, finally, Please, uh, you know the drill on cell phones, pagers, anything that rings, please take a time now and turn them off until the plane has landed and we've taxied up to the jetway. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs here at Sonoma State University, Dr. Carol blackshire Belay, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Good evening. It is such an honor to have Dr. Malifi Ketiasanti here at Sonoma State University. Uh, Dr. Asanti has been a friend of mine, a colleague of mine for over 20 years. And we've kept in contact all of this time. And for you to have the opportunity to hear Dr. Asante speak this evening, you will leave this evening with quite a bit to talk about. Dr. Malifi Keti Asante is Professor, Department of African American Studies at Temple University. Considered by his peers to be one of the most distinguished contemporary scholars, Dr. Asante has published extensively in the field of African and African American studies, including his most recent publication of the history of Africa, The Quest for Eternal Harmony, Cheek Anta Diop, An Intellectual Portrait, and The Handbook of Black Studies, co-edited with Dr. Malauna Karenga. In the 1990s, black issues in higher education 
recognized Dr. Asante as one of the most influential leaders in the decade. Dr. Asante completed his master's degree at Perpidine and received his PhD from UCLA at the age of 26 and was appointed a full professor at the age of 30 at the State University of New York at Buffalo. At Temple University, he created the first PhD program in African American studies in 1987. He has directed more than 130 PhD dissertations and has written more than 300 articles for journals and magazines and is the founder of the theory of Afrocentricity. Dr. Asante was born in Valdosta, Georgia, of Nubian and Yoruba heritage, also one of 16 children. He is a poet, dramatist, and a painter. His work on African culture and philosophy has been cited by several journals, including the Journal of Black Studies, Journal, journal of Communication, American Scholar, Didophilus, Western Journal of Black Studies, and Africological Perspectives. The Utni Reader called him one of the 100 leading thinkers in America, and Asante was recognized in a survey as one of the 25 influential African males of the last 200 years. In 2001, Transition Magazine said, and I quote, Dr. Asante may be the most important professor in black America, end of quote. In 2002, Dr. Asante received the Distinguished Douglas Inninger Award for rhetorical scholarship from the National Communication Association. The African Union cited him as one of the 12 top scholars of African descent when it invited him to give one of the keynote addresses at the Conference of Intellectuals of Africa and the Diaspora in Dakar in 2004. Dr. Asante was inducted into the Literary Hall of Fame for writers of African descent at the Gwendolyn Brooks Center at Chicago State University in 2004 and is the recipient of more than 100 awards, including Honorary Professor Xinjiang University in China. Dr. Asante is a prolific writer, speaker, and scholar, and we are so honored to welcome him to Sonoma State this evening. So now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Malifi Asante. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. All right, be careful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank Dr. Blackshire Balai for her introduction. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Atler uh, for his remarks and also share in thanking the uh, North Bay International Studies Project, uh, the School of Extended Education, the Global and International Education Committee, Phi Beta, Delta and the Napa Valley Unified School District uh, for having me come and present here tonight uh, on this important topic, important subject. I'm really delighted to be at Sonoma State and I want to start by perhaps giving you an orientation to the general discussion that I will have with you. And let me start historically and sort of set a context and then talk about the African Renaissance in terms of what's happening on the ground today as we, as we sit here uh, in uh, Sonoma. Uh, in 1444, the first Portuguese ship came down the west coast of Africa and took 70 Africans back to Lisbon. And at that moment in history, we began what might be called the European participation in the diaspora of Africans. That is the scattering of Africans from the continent of Africa 
to other places. There had already been, of course, the scattering that was produced by the Arabs on the eastern side of Africa, and that had lasted for hundreds of years, and that produced also another diaspora of Africans in the eastern part of Africa and also in Arabia and uh, throughout uh, the Indian Ocean. Earlier, there was another migration, which was a migration of Africans from the continent of Africa to various parts of the world. And of course, the last one was a prehistoric migration of Africans. I mean, the six billion people that we have in the world today are basically Africans in terms of the DNA. So we know if we take a monogenetic theory of human origin, that is where human beings originated in one place, whether you take biology or whether you take archeology, span the argument is that all human beings originated on the continent of Africa. So we have two historic diasporas created, one by the Arabs, one by the Europeans. These diasporas also created uh, other situations where you have enormous populations of Africans, for example, in South America and in North America, in the Caribbean, if you take just the American side, the Atlantic side. Uh, and if you look at that population, you will also discover that there are more black people who live in South America than who live in North America. Most of us don't know that, but there are more black people living in South America, in Brazil, in Ecuador, in uh, Peru, actually every country down there with the exception perhaps of uh, Bolivia and, uh, and uh, Paraguay and uh, Chile, and a small population in Argentina, but not very large. But the rest of the countries, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, um, Guyana, uh, Suriname, Brazil, Brazil has the largest population of black people outside of Africa, perhaps with the exception maybe of the Sidi population in India. But you have a huge population in Brazil of 70 to 75 million black people who live in that country. Uh, so you have also the population of Africans in the Caribbean, which is a large population in the Caribbean. Whether you take uh, uh, Cuba, or whether you take uh, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, uh, Bahamas, Bar uh, Barbados, Trinidad, etc., many, many uh, African people living in those places. There's a, there's a population in uh, Mexico. There's a population um, of Africans in Mexico, the Afro-Mexican population, which has been there a long time, uh, actually from the 1600s. And then you have uh, populations in Canada, in Nova Scotia. Uh, these were populations that uh, have also been uh, in uh, Canada, in Ontario as well, been, in, been there for a long time. And what I am saying to you essentially is that the the African diaspora, that is the scattering of Africans, is a scattering that has occurred uh, throughout the Americas and is uh, directly related to uh, the prospects for the future of Africa itself. And I, I will explain what I mean by that in a minute. But let me just go to 1948 and give you uh, the statement that this title comes from, the title of my presentation tonight. A young man who was 25 years old, who had been born in a town called K2. Actually, it wasn't a town, it really is a, it's a village. It's a village with no roads. You can't, you can't even get there by a road. You have to go across fields. I've been to this place. It's in Senegal. It's uh, called K2. But normally, when we talk about uh, Sheikh Anta Jope, we say that he was from Jerbel. Jerbel, you can get to by a road, but where he was really born, you can't get to. So you, you really have to go across fields to get there. But um, he was born in K2, went to school in Jerbel, and then went to school in St. Louis, which was at that time when he was uh, uh, growing up. He was born in 1923. When he was growing up, 
he went to the French school in Saint Louis, which was a capital, the French capital of uh, French West Africa at that time. And after that, he was uh, sent to Paris by his family to become educated in French culture, French uh, education. And he went, he was an excellent student, studied physics. Uh, but when he was 25 years old, by the time uh, he had studied physics, got his first degree, uh, and decided that he wanted to go into history, uh, he wrote an article for a journal that was called Presence Africaine. And in this journal, at 25 years of age, this young African man asked the question, when shall we speak of an African Renaissance? This is a profound question that he uh, asked. And it was a question that was necessary. In fact, it was a question that um, should have come earlier. But it was perhaps not in the cards because the colonization process, that is the European colonization of Africa, had essentially broken apart uh, the traditional patterns of African life and culture. Uh, and so people were not thinking of that. People were thinking of how do I become a better French person, a better English person if they had been colonized by the English or Belgian, and so forth and so on. In 1884 and 85, these are good dates to remember. In November of 1884, there was a big conference that was held in Berlin, Germany. And it was under the direction of Willem von Bismarck at the request of his friend, King Leopold of Belgium. So let's have a conference and uh, let's decide something about Africa. This is 1884, right? Now, in 1884 and 85, a couple of things had already happened, things that uh, historically we can look back and perhaps say, oh, well, maybe uh, the 1884 conference is coming because the things that have already happened simply predicted almost logically that it should happen. For example, uh, you recall this, or if you know a little bit about American history, you, we know this. In 1880, 1865, there was the end of the slave slavery in America. That is, the Civil War ended in 1865 in this country. And we also know that before that time, in 1807, this was the year, the date at which there should be the end of slavery on the high seas. In other words, by that time, our, the Constitution of the United States had said it. By, because the Constitution was ratified in my city, where I'm from, Philadelphia, in 1787. They said, okay, 20 years from now, there should be no more Africans brought across the ocean to the Americas. There's no more. Cannot happen anymore after... 20 years. So 1807 is supposed to end. The British Parliament also said, no more. We, we're not doing this anymore. Now, you can still have slavery in these countries, in the Americas, but you can't bring Africans. You can't, can't import Africans uh, from Africa into the Americas anymore. And so that was supposed to be the end. Of course, it did not. We know it did not end. There were many uh, uh, slave ships that still came into the Americas. In fact, the last slave ship that came to the United States came in 1859, to show you, show you how people you know, didn't really recognize the 1807 date. But, but the 1807 date was important because psychologically what it said was, OK, no longer would nations be able to profit from the slave trade. This was what was agreed upon. But now, for 300 years, nations had been profiting, almost 400 years in some cases. Nations had been profiting from the slave trade. What do you do to replace the, the profit from the slave trade now that you no longer have it? What, what, what can nations do? And, and, and the European economy, to a large degree, its industrialization, 
had been based, had been fueled by the slave trade. It brought much money into the economies of Europe. So what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with this issue? That's where the Conference of 1884 is important. Because the Conference of 1884, in November of 1884, it lasted to February of uh, 85, 1885, uh, that conference was a conference of 14 nations, two of them, Turkey and uh, the United States, were basically observers, basically 12 nations, to come together and to decide uh, what they were going to do with Africa. This is very, it's very critical because otherwise we don't understand why the Renaissance is necessary or, or, or what the prospects and the challenges are for, for the um, Renaissance of Africa or for the diaspora, of Af the diaspora of Africa, that is the Africans who are not on the continent. This conference was basically provoked by King Leopold because King Leopold had asked Henry Stanley, this was the man who was famous for uh, the New York uh, newspaper, I think the Mirror, sending, uh, sending him to uh, Africa to find uh, David Livingstone. And you remember the, the quote, uh, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. That, that was made by Henry uh, uh, Stanley. So Stanley had, Stanley had a big reputation because he had gone to Africa, he traveled throughout the continent, he had discovered David Livingstone, he became a superstar, he was a celebrity in the, in the 19th century. And as a celebrity, King Leopold asked him if he would undertake a mission for him, not for Belgium, but for the king personally. And that is, I, the king says, I want my own colony. Not for my country, for me. I want my colony. I'll pay you my personal money if you can give, give me a colony in Africa. And so Stanley said, I can give you a colony. I just need to you know, hire 7,000 troops, soldiers, and uh, get some money from you, and I'll go there and I'll carve out a, an empire for you. And of course, basically, that's what he did in a very ruthless way. Professor over at Berkeley, Adam Hoschildt, has written a very important book called King Leopold's Ghost. If you get a chance, get that book. It's a very critical book on this issue, King Leopold's Ghost. But at any rate, when Stanley had completed his mission of basically subduing the Congo uh, for um, King Leopold, Leopold never went to Africa, he never set foot on the continent, but he, he owned basically a colony that was a hundred times the size of Belgium. And he, he had never seen it, but it was, he got the profit from it. So he basically forced Bismarck, because Bismarck of course was the major leader of Europe at this time, forced him to have this conference so we can decide, all of us European nations can decide what belongs to uh, Germany, what belongs to France, what belongs to Britain, what belongs to uh, Holland, what belongs to uh, uh, Spain, what belongs to Portugal, and so forth. And so when they called the meeting, they had in front of them, actually in the middle of them, they were sitting in the round, they had before them a huge physical map of Africa. And when Leopold saw it, he referred to it as this magnificent African cake. That, that our job is to decide among us, Europeans, what part each of us would want. Now there were no Africans at this conference, not one. No African president, uh, pre, uh, no, no African kings, no African uh, queens, no African representatives of governments, uh, uh, neither the two independent African countries, uh, Ethiopia or Liberia, they were not there. No, nobody was there. This, is just, this was European business. And they had, they took a long time to make this decision. And as they looked at the map, they began to divide it. So, uh, you know, if the Germans wanted the mountain called uh, Kilimanjaro, 
for, for uh, their colony, the East uh, African colony. Uh, then the British said, well, give us Mount Kenya. You know, you can't take two, both of the mountains. You take one, we take one. And they drew lines, and drew lines all over the map. And ultimately, what they had was essentially the Africa that we see on the map today. I mean, there are some slight changes, but for the most part, I mean, the changes have been in name only. You know, uh, what was northern and southern Rhodesia becomes Zambia, and Zimbabwe, for example, but essentially the lines drawn were lines that had been created by these nations, and the French got the largest share. They got 36% of the whole continent of Africa belonged to the French, and about 32% of it belonged to the British. Now, how did they do this? I mean, what was the basic doctrine that allowed them to create this particular arrangement. There were three doctrines that came out of the Berlin Conference. The first doctrine, uh, I, is, I call it uh, in my book, um, um, The History of Africa, I call it, uh, the first one, the sphere of influence. The sphere of influence. That is, what they said was something like this. If you have any proof that you have any influence in a particular region of Africa, then that belongs to you. If, of course, there is a challenge from another European nation about that, then we have to have a second doctrine. This is the doctrine of effective occupation. For example, if you say, if you are Portugal, that you have an interest in uh, the area that now is called Ghana, but at one time was called the Gold Coast. You say, we have an interest in uh, this region because it is under our sphere of influence because in 1482 we sent a mission there to trade with the local kings. Then the British could say, well, but no, we effectively control that area. We, we have a, a fortress there. Not only do we have a fortress there, we, we control the, the trade and the Portuguese don't control anything there now. So basically that belongs to us. So, so basically that's what they did. They, 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 there was a, a, a lot of bargaining going on, uh, haggling actually, about who owned what and who had what influence. So these were the first two doctrines. The doctrine of the sphere of influence, if you had some influence on a particular part of Africa, then that we would agree that that's yours. If you have effective occupation of the territory, then obviously that's yours. Then the third one was, if you have had any agents in the territory, even though it is not occupied by you, even though there's no real sphere of influence, but you have had a missionary to go in, you have had um, uh, a, an explorer to go in, you've had a merchant to go in at one time or the other, uh, then you can also claim that you have a le legitimate interest in that particular part of Africa. And if you have a legitimate interest in that particular part of Africa, then you can make a claim to say, okay, that belongs to you. Now, they did this, and when they finished, they had about 53 nations. Uh, 50, well, actually, they didn't have 53 nations. Then. They, they had territories, and these territories were then divided into nations, and then you had about 53 nations on the continent of Africa. Now, many people still think of Africa as one country, and they, when people say, I'm from Africa, they don't realize that you're really talking about 53, and actually in some senses, 54 nations in Africa. And each of these nations are different. But not only are you talking about 54 nations, you're talking about 18 different ethnic groups, 1,800 different ethnic groups. So you got 1,800 uh, different ethnic groups, and you got uh, 54 nations. You have tremendous diversity. But when the Europeans met in Berlin, they were not concerned about the ethnic diversity. So what you had, sometimes people, uh, 
who were Yoruba, for example, would live in two different countries under the Europeans because the lines that were drawn in Berlin actually split up ethnic groups and because Europeans didn't, didn't much care about that. I mean, their idea was, you know, this was the area that we have the sphere of influence in and our effective occupation, we want this part. And then if another country wants that part, then the same ethnic group is, is divided. People cannot visit their relatives anymore. Uh, you know, the, 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 the routes that they would take uh, uh, freely are no longer free because they're actually crossing border borders. You're going from French-controlled territory to English-controlled territory, and you've got to have the proper papers. And so, in fact, you, many problems were created by virtue of this. Now, this pattern had been a pattern that had been created earlier during the slave trade. Because during the slave trade, when it initially started, Europe had to decide how do we uh, uh, continue this process of going into Africa, bringing Africans out of Africa, and then enslaving them in the Americas without fighting with each other. Because uh, initially, they fought with each other. I mean, this is what happened to the Portuguese, actually, in, in Ghana, in the Gold Coast. The, the Portuguese are there first, and they are, they are trading, and then they get into the business of bringing Africans out of the region, and then the Dutch are looking at this uh, very enviously, and then the Dutch decide that they will come in, and they will uh, fight the Portuguese to take control of this rich area. And they did, and they defeated the uh, Portuguese, and the Dutch took over, and then later on the British took over from them. So then they had to come to some agreement. How do we all trade in Africa for Africans and not fight Europeans? And they created something called the Asiento. The Asiento was that each nation or each shipping company that wanted to get involved in the slave trade had to first get permission from the Catholic Church and the, and the King of Spain. You had to have an authority to go into a particular region, a particular latitude or longitude in Africa to bring out Africans. This was called the Asiento. The Asiento, A-S-I-E-N-T-O. Now the Asiento, if someone, if you were in a particular area and you were trading uh, of, uh, and bringing out Africans, and another European nation with their ships came in there and said, no, we want to do business in this, this area. All you had to do is show them Asiento. No, this is, we have our Asiento. You have to go get your Asiento to get another area because this is our area. That prevented battles. It presented, it pre presented wars between Europe. The 1884 and 85 conference was essentially the same kind of thing since slavery is gone. How now do we control the resources of the continent of Africa? And that's why they went to this uh, Berlin conference. I had to give you this background because, uh, because to, to tell you now about what the Renaissance is about, um, you, you, you can see it, I, think, I hope, for, hopefully, uh, clearer. Um, the Renaissance now comes on the heel of a couple of things. In 1957, there is the independence of the country of Ghana. Uh, you can probably tell I have a Ghanaian name. Uh, Asante is a Ghanaian name. Um, it's a country, of course, it's very close to many African Americans because of Kwame Nkrumah, who was the first president, uh, went to school here. And not only did he go to school, but he was a uh, mentee of W.B. Du Bois, uh, the greatest African-American intellectual. So everybody, I mean, people, many African-Americans go to Ghana um, and, and in all kinds of capacities. I mean, I, I, I'm instilled as a king in Ghana, uh, largely because, again, of the, 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 the road that was traveled by Kwame Nkrumah when he was a, a student and when he went back, and also his relationship with Nkrumah, I mean, rather with Du Bois. But, 
That was 1957. We, this year we celebrate the jubilee of that. Actually, uh, two, uh, three days, four days ago, uh, uh, five days ago, uh, the celebration, uh, March 7th, of the independence of Ghana, because the independence of Ghana was the first attempt, um, actually the, the second, it was really the second attempt, the first one, first one to break away was Egypt in 52. And then in 57, 57 you had Ghana to break out from the colonial uh, power and colonial authority. Now, these two countries breaking out from the colonial administration that had been set up at Berlin, this was actually revolutionary. I mean, it was like, wow. I mean, they could actually fight against the colonial powers of Europe and win. And, th and, and you, you remember, you got 54 countries. Only two of them are independent, Liberia and Ethiopia. All the rest, from Algeria to South Africa, are basically in some form or the other of European control. And so the independence of Egypt, the independence of Ghana, these were very transforming events in the life of Africa. But because of the way it was structured, each country had to gain its independence individually. And that was a hard thing. Because when they fought internally to gain their independence, it wasn't like when Senegal got its independence, the rest of Africa was independent. Or when Algeria fought to get its independence, the rest of Africa was independent. In fact, when Ghana got its independence, Kwame Nkrumah said, and he said this on the night of the independence, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the total liberation of the African continent. But of course, you can say that, but those people in Nigeria are still not free. The people in Kenya are still not free. And so each country had to go through its own birth, own development. What this did was to create a situation in which African nations depended on their own internal energies to create nationhood. Nationhood. They fought for nationhood. But they fought for nationhood. This is my assessment. They fought for nationhood along the wrong lines. They fought for nationhood along the lines of the created nation states that had been outlined by the Europeans. That is Africa's Achilles heel. Now, what is the Renaissance and how shall we speak of the Renaissance of Africa? Here's how it's being done. In 2002, the Organization of African Unity which came into birth very soon after the independence of Ghana. This was an organization made up of those few states initially that were independent. Kwame Nkrumah and, uh, uh, Ga uh, uh, and uh, Nasser, the president of Egypt, uh, Haile Selassie, the president of the emperor of Ethiopia at the time. They got together and they created this organization of African unity. But the Organization of African Unity was an idea that had no teeth and no power, and it was just a dream, and it was nothing more. It could do nothing. It had, they, they would meet once a year, basically. That was what they could do. There, there was nothing strong in it. It went out of, it was created, I think, in 1963. It went out of business in 2002. And another organization was created, which was called the African Union. The African Union was created with one purpose in mind, to create the United States of Africa. Now, this is different. This is where we are now. At the, this is the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, I am a consultant to uh, the African Union. I'm on the scientific committee of the African Union, and I also work with the uh, Senegalese president 
in this regard. That is, the creation of a African Federated Union. And this is already being done. I mean, it's not even being talked about. The idea of Pan-African Union, which was an idea that NASA believed in and an idea that Nkrumah believed in, that idea is already working on the ground. Initially, what Africans did was to create regional organizations like ECOWAS, which is an organization of West African states, SADC, which is an organization of Southern African states, an East African uh, 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 organization, uh, a North African organization, and a Central African organization. Now, those organizations are being translate, translated into the backbone of what is going to be the United States of Africa. The proposal is already on uh, the table. Uh, there was a meeting of six presidents, a subcommittee uh, of six presidents uh, about a year ago in Abuja, Nigeria that I attended, in which they have already outlined uh, this idea. Uh, uh, first of all, first thing, a common passport so that Africans will have one passport. It won't, be say, won't say Kenya, won't say Nigeria, say Africa. Your, your country is Africa. One currency, the Afro, which would be used all over the continent of Africa. They're already moving on these, these things. Um, there would be one, one military command. There would be um, one foreign uh, uh, policy. Uh, not 54 different foreign policies, one foreign policy. Uh, there, there would be um, uh, one um, economic uh, policy, one general educational uh, system, uh, uh, and also uh, you would have uh, common uh, tariffs so that, uh, uh, you know, uh, you would not have people trading between different countries with different uh, tariffs rates and so forth. Th these are things that are already happening and, they, and they're working on these things on the ground as we speak. The foreign ministers of these 54 countries are hard at work trying to figure it out. In July of this year, at the Accra Conference of the Heads of State of Africa, they will begin the process of, of, uh, of, of putting this uh, not only to the public uh, 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 test, but they will also uh, be trying to set up legislative uh, legislation that will allow different countries to begin the process of having referendum, referenda in, in countries to decide uh, if, if they want to move ahead with this. This is a very beautiful prospect. If Africa were to become a federative state, United States of Africa, it would be the largest country in the world. It will have 12 million square miles. It will be larger than Russia, which is now the largest country in the world. It would be the third largest country in the world in terms of population, with a billion people. It will also be a huge market and will create the uh, possibility for Africans moving from Casablanca to Johannesburg, from Nairobi to Lagos, uh, to um, Addis Ababa uh, without problems, without border problems. With, in fact, quite frankly, as I have seen it over the last five or six years, uh, the masses of African people have already destroyed in their minds the original ideas that were created by the Europeans in 1884 when they created the boundaries and the borders of what is what, because people are walking across these boundaries as if they don't exist anyway. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people are on the move in Africa every day. And they don't care about the, uh, you know, the, the borders. Uh, you know, so if I want to go to South Africa, I go, if I live in Zimbabwe. If I want to go to Zambia, I go. I mean, I don't, there's no problem here. They say you don't have a passport, or you don't have a visa, no, I go. I mean, it's Africa. So the masses of people, by their feet, are already voting for the idea of a single Africa. So this is a, 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 an idea that is, as I said, that is, also, is coming. It's already in a place uh, in many parts of, of, of Africa itself. Now, what are the problems? There are many challenges. 
The first challenge that I see is the challenge of uh, is a challenge of language, because people say, "Well, which language?" But they, they've they've tried to resolve this. They've said, "Right now, we probably have to go with uh, with maybe even four languages in Africa. Uh, one African language, which would probably be Kiswahili, uh, Arabic, uh, English, and French, uh, because otherwise you you cannot operate." Uh, on the continent, but but those those four country, four languages would be considered official languages of the of the country, so that's one of the issues. the The other one, of course, is this high idea of sovereignty um, that some states feel a, a, a deeper relationship to their own sovereignty than other states. The president of Senegal, Abdoulaye Wade, who is probably one of the most brilliant people I've ever met just uh, made a statement a couple of years ago, which I still like, uh, and I, I appreciate it so much. He said, if we could bring this about today, this United States of Africa, I would gladly serve as governor of Senegal. And this was, this was backed up by um, uh, 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 Colonel uh, Gaddafi, who said the same thing about Libya, that if we could bring, if we could bring this into being, I would uh, gladly uh, serve under a president of the whole of Africa and, and simply be uh, like a governor for, uh, for Libya. Those are the, they, they're probably the two most progressive leaders in Africa on this, uh, Gaddafi and Wad. Um, Mbeki is also progressive on it. O o Obasanjo, or who of Nigeria is progressive on it, but he's leaving office. The people who, there are people who are not for it wholeheartedly. I mean, there are certainly um, uh, 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 Melis Zanawi of Ethiopia has problems with the idea. And I think he has problems with the idea largely because of the unique historical relationship uh, of Ethiopia to uh, its own particularity as um, a, a, a country that has a 4,000 year history. And I think that there's a very great fear of giving this up to become a part of, uh, of, of Africa and just be called Africa with a region in Africa called Ethiopia. I think that's a big issue with him. I heard him voice this type of concern. But these are the issues. There's one other issue that has come up. And that is, some people say, well, if, if we become the United States of Africa, we will then have to lose uh, uh, all these votes that we have in the United Nations. And my answer to that uh, last year uh, in my own statement to them was that you have all these votes, but they don't amount to very much. In fact, they don't amount to very much because almost any Western or European nation could simply uh, manipulate uh, almost any of these African countries because they're so small. Take, for example, Chad. You probably don't know very much about Chad or haven't heard very much about Chad. But I'll tell you, right now, the United States is actively involved in Chad. Not only actively involved in Chad, training the military in Chad, but it is building bases in Chad. And not only is it building bases in Chad, it is providing Chad with money for oil exploration. So the U.S. is deeply involved in Chad. Right now, it can manipulate Chad any minute. All Bush has to say is, you, do you want our money? Uh, then this is what you do, because Chad is a very poor country. Right now it is, but it is potentially very wealthy because of its oil reserves. That's, um, that's, that's what we, we don't know. So, so one powerful Africa with one vote in the Security Council is worth more than the 54 votes of African nations um, in the UN w without power. So, so what, what, we're, what we're talking about here is how Africa can position itself for that final push for its renaissance. I'm going to um, make a one more, a couple of more statements, and then I'll just open it up for questions. Uh, this is a process. The Renaissance will not be complete when you have a United States of Africa. That's not, 
I mean, that's a political uh, uh, issue and it's a political solution. But the politics is only one part of it. The other one is a mental, mental liberation. People's minds have to be liberated. And if the minds are not liberated, then you cannot have any other liberation. This is where the diaspora comes into play. Um, a part of the uh, African Union's uh, uh, plan uh, under its NEPOD uh, program, the new, new Partnership program, is to new, have a new partnership with the African diaspora in the Americas. And that is to link Africa now with uh, people in uh, Jamaica, in Cuba, in the United States, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Colombia, and so on. And that has uh, taken, it, take, it took off last year in the first level when President Lula of Brazil and President Wad made an agreement, the first agreement to have a direct flight from Dakar in Senegal to Fortaleza in Brazil. This is the first time. You can cross the ocean in four hours. From, from Dakar, Senegal to Fortaleza, Brazil is only four hours across the Atlantic. They have now, they did that last year. You have a regular flight be, between. This had not happened before. It seems like it would have been natural. But before, the idea was not to integrate Africa with the diaspora. Now the idea is to integrate. But at the same time, under the a leadership of two African-American secretaries of state, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, I think the U.S. has uh, become uh, the greatest military uh, force in Africa. And this is unfortunate in my judgment. Uh, what has happened in Africa under the, these two black secretaries of state is that they have moved into Africa to create about 10 military bases in Africa. And, and basically they have just, you may have read this last week, they just created a, what they call a new African command, they call it what Af, um, Afro, uh, oh, AFRICOM, AFRICOM. AFRICOM is the United States Military Command for Africa. And this is the first time they had a command for Africa because now they got these military bases in Africa and the idea behind this is to position the U.S. military to be able to move quickly into Angola where there is oil, into Nigeria where there is oil, into Gabon where there is oil, and to protect what they consider to be, what at least the military or the Bush government considers to be, uh, America's interest in the oil resources of Africa in, in case they run into difficulty with the oil resources uh, in, uh, in Arabia. This is, this is the way they are structured that. Um, Kwame Nkrumah would say in all of this, that what we have to do in terms of this renaissance then, in an African sense, is to work with education so that people will understand not only themselves in a context of their own ethnicities, but in the context of themselves as Africans. If we do that, and then we also have the possibility of dual citizenships with uh, Africans who have been removed from the continent for hundreds of years, then it is possible that we can lead uh, to a new revolution in the African continent. Forward ever, backwards never. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Asante, We'll be happy to answer questions, probably about 10, 15 minutes. And somebody out there has microphones, if anybody needs it, to ask brilliant questions, or not so brilliant questions. But there's somebody up here.
more an idea of that really would happen. Would he have to solve more internally each individual nation's issues as an like um, Mozambique currently is having a lot of issues with all these floods that are going on. So a lot of people are going hungry and a lot of people are having to go elsewhere to survive because their region is flooded and there's no and the previous aid that was there has just been flooded by the cyclone that happened a week ago. So things in things like that, wouldn't you first want to make sure that the country is willing first to say, okay, we are okay as a nation, so now we're ready to take this other step. Because if not, then how do you have this foundation of being able to create this United um, States of Africa without making sure every country is okay within themselves Thank you. and okay to It's a good question, and, and it's, a, it's a very important question. Um, did y'all, did everybody hear? Yeah. Uh, the, the answer to that is, is this. You can never wait until every country is uh, actually um, where it thinks it ought to be. And the case uh, that you gave, for example, the Mozambique, or if you give the case of Darfur, or any of these cases, uh, I always think of uh, Louisiana and Katrina. And the case of uh, uh, Louisiana and Katrina, I mean, people could say, well, you know, Louisiana better get its act together first. You know, they're having you know, incredible problems down there before we can decide whether or not they're going to be anything. But if you had one nation, then the people in Mozambique who were experiencing problems with floods, you could just take them to Zimbabwe. You could take them just like we did the people in Louisiana. We just say, okay, you got problems in New Orleans, uh, come to Seattle. Same country, but if, of course, Louisiana is itself a nation by itself and it has to deal with its problems by itself, it is, it is, it's overwhelming. It's almost impossible. It's a country that could, could, never, could never exist by itself. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I think at one time, if you had considered Nevada, maybe it's not true now, maybe because you, of Las Vegas and and Reno but, Reno, but if you had uh, at one time considered Nevada a country alone by itself, it would not have been viable. It's basically desert. But, but and, and this is the way I think about countries like Chad, Niger, um, Mali, uh, Libya, Senegal, getting more and more into Senegal, but not, Senegal has, has much more fertile land in the south. But, but there's some countries that basically should not, should, they have to be connected to other countries in order to be uh, viable. And I think that uh, the, the United States is a good example, good model for that. That, that, that because you, you guys live in a pretty rich state, California, uh, you know, I could live in Louisiana and say I'm still a part of the United States because the people in California are, you know, doing pretty good, you see. So that, that's, that, that, I mean, that's the way I would feel in Africa is the same way, you know. I mean, people would say, okay, okay, I live in, I mean, yeah, my home is in uh, Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, in Ouagadougou. And yeah, it's basically dry and hot and desert here. But uh, when we go on vacation, we go to the beach uh, in Durban, South Africa, or we go to the beach in Abidjan or somewhere, you know? Okay, I'm sorry, yes. I was just gonna ask you to imply that, because um, you're saying that there are areas like, like America where you have that 30 degree of latitude and it's a desert. And it's not even much that's gonna grow there anyway, but there are uh, people in civilization that have been there for so long, are you implying that to make it work, they have to remove the people? No, that's a good point. No, no, they, they don't have to be, they don't have to uh, be moved, but they do have the possibility of moving on their own if they want to move. For example, there is in Mali uh, many, and, and in southern uh, Libya and Algeria, uh, many uh, African people who live in the desert. And they, they're, they're accustomed to living in the desert. But one problem that even the desert dwellers have is that in the past, before 1884 and 85, you could go from Algeria to Libya with no problem. 
But because now there are these definite borders, you, you find border guards. You can't, you can't well, they, they can get around them, but, but you can't go from one country to another like people did in the old times. So I think, again, even the people who want to live the pastoral life, they can live that pastoral life better in a United States of Africa where they have much wider territory than they have now. Yes. question and I must tell you a real this is a real live fact a few years ago when uh, I was invited to speak at the University of Manchester in England um, when the man when the guy met me at the airport the professor met me at the airport to take me to the university uh, I was joking but uh, but I said to him um, this is the first time I'm in Manchester and you know I'm of African descent and I'm going to um, call um, uh, Manchester the new Kumasi. From now on, it would be the new Kumasi. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, it was a joke. But, but what I was basically doing was basically what Idi Amin did with the Scottish. You people, people don't know. Do you know why, why, that, why that movie is called uh, Last King of Scotland? Part, anybody know that? Why? Well, the, he, he. Okay. Okay. This is very interesting because you know why it, it was his official title. His official title. He named him, he was the president of Uganda and the king of Scotland. And, and, and he did it officially because, and what he did it was to mark what the Europeans did when they came to Uganda. They said this is this belonged to Queen whoever, this is this is this is the territory of Queen Victoria. Whatever. So he says, oh, you guys can do that. I can do that too. So basically, well, I'm, you you think you're the you're the you're the Queen of Uganda. <laughs> I'm the King of Scotland, and it was a part of his title. If you look at, because I wondered about that, and I looked and I read his life story, and uh, it was he 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 had a number of orders and titles that he gave himself. And one of them was the King of Scotland. So I said, that's where they got that from. He was the king, that's how. And so, so what he was doing was basically that same kind of thing. But yeah, you do have people sometimes who take that authority and say, okay, you know, we can do this. And they can do it without the people. But of course, people always revolt in those situations when they discover that, hey, wait a minute, you know, you've taken over our land. Who gave you the right to do that? And then you have resistance, and you will have this resistance until that comes away. Let me see. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I spent a little bit of time in East Africa volunteering, and so I'm thinking about the practical application to like, people I know on the shores of Lake Victoria mm -hmm. who are less than an hour a day. And I'm wondering who's going to pay for the infrastructure of of the U.S., the United States of Africa, when people in Kenya, for instance, when the infrastructure barely exists there now, mm -hmm. and where's the money going to come from that pays for the people going to meet it? Yes. An economy that cannot, you know, it's not a Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, they, they're working on that too. That's a good question because uh, you, you're going to have to have a legislature that's probably going to be a thousand people you know, much like the Chinese legislature or something, you people come from all these different places and you probably, if you're gonna have a referendum uh, on, on an issue, you're gonna have to have a whole lot of money to have a, a, a votes and so forth. Uh, but one thing to re remember is this, that right now, if you take the 54 countries of Africa and you count up the number of people under arms, that is military, 
it is the largest army in the world. If you take the 53, put them together, it'd be the largest military in the world. So you don't need all those people on the arms, number one. You don't need to put all that money in the military. Some countries have militaries, they don't even need them. So, so, so I think there's gonna be some cost cutting. Uh, there's gonna be also some restructuring. Uh, I, there, there's duplication, a lot of duplication. There's some countries that have airlines that do not need airline companies. Uh, so there, there are many ways that they're gonna have to save, but it's gonna be a big problem. I mean, it's obviously, uh, when you start talking about money, it's a, it's a major problem. And, but you also are talking about the richest continent on the face of the earth in terms of natural resources. So what they've got to do is to manage the resources better, to exploit them better for the interests of the people, and, uh, and to create uh, a good, effective government. And I think that this is something that will help bring about the Renaissance. It, it, there are people who are, I mean, real good, solid, strong people who are willing to do this uh, and who are trying to do it in all kinds of ways. There are projects that have to be developed, like in transportation and so forth. I mean, Gaddafi, for example, demonstrated that you could, that it was no problem to drive from, um, from, from Libya, uh, from Tripoli to Accra in Ghana. Uh, overland by bringing 300 automobiles uh, across the desert, you know, from uh, uh, making his, his tour of Ghana was by automobile. He just said, okay, we're going to just drive, you know, to, 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 to get people used to the idea that, the, that you can move in the continent and, you know, and, and, and you have to be able to do these kinds of things. So I think that with, with, with uh, certainly with uh, the management of uh, many of the resources, uh, uh, they, they will be able to do it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. There was a question in the back, too. Yeah, there's already been a lot of exploitation of the natural resources in Africa by people from outside Africa to corporations who are trying to exploit them for their own benefit. Yeah. So the nationalization yes. Kind of this is a very good question. There are two fears. There are, there, are the corporate, there are the corporation fears and there are the state fears. Corporation fears uh, are, uh, yeah, are are really very they're similar to the state fears. The state fears, particularly the the previous colonial states and also China, which is now a big player in Africa, uh, th their fears are that if you have a United States of Africa, you now have one general policy. Right now, you're able to exploit different nations at different rates and levels because you can play one against the other. Th th that will not be the case. I mean, corporations have rushed into Africa since, uh, the last, since 2002 to try to uh, create bilateral agreements between one nation and the corporation, or, or, or China has been doing this recently, creating uh, regular uh, um, contracts between nations in a bilateral way. This complicates, this is one of the challenges of the United States of Africa because this com complicates problems when you already have contractual agreements with foreign powers. I mean, how are they gonna be handled by the new country? I mean, that is a, it's a big problem. Yes, it is, and the corporations are doing the same thing. There are many people who are saying, look, we can, we can help you with the gold mines, the diamond, we can help you exploit the uranium and, you know, let's make this 20-year agreement. And for 20 years then, what do you do when you have now a new state authority that says, look, we don't recognize that agreement. I mean, international law, international court would probably say you have to recognize it. So those, we're very concerned about that because we see it happening over and over again. And the United States is involved in it as well. I mean, whole idea, rush, let's sort of like rush in and make as many agreements with these African states as they now exist so that if there is ever a United States of Africa, it will have to deal with all these uh, problems, you see. Okay. You want to, someone want to direct this? Okay, I don't know, because uh, there's, there's several. You choose.
Now, denied us information by the most powerful general strike led by women in Oaxaca, Mexico. And I believe that if we were to join with them in solidarity, it would be enough power to shut down the greed from California to the White House for as long as we need to attain the control, which could be then run by students, which would not be beholden to any corporate interests. Thank you. I agree with that. Thank you. I think it's a good point. Absolutely. And I think we should have solidarity. In the Mumia case, we have all demonstrated in Philadelphia, of course, on this. This is an ongoing issue. Okay, yes? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, threw that out. But what would the governmental structure look like? How would that be implemented? And what kind of, and in terms of the government being really higher power, what would that look like? Well, what, uh, here's what they have said. They have said, first of all, it has to happen within the next 20 years. If it doesn't happen within the next 20 years, uh, there will be, the, the resources of Africa will, have been, will, will really be, Squandered in terms of a, of a, uh, a sol in terms of the solidarity of, of the uh, of the continent, because um, there are very aggressive interests in Africa right now. Very aggressive interests. Uh, I think the government will probably be probably um, uh, a, a Republican type of, of democracy. I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think right now, I don't see it, uh, I, don't, I don't see it as a, uh, any, any kind of a parliamentarian uh, system. I think basically they're looking at a presidential system and that kind of thing. I don't mean Republican in terms of American politics, by the way. <laughs> please don't, please don't get, get me. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mean that. Uh, but... Uh, but 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 in just in, in terms of the state structure is what I'm talking about, and uh, they they are uh, you know uh, th there are many patterns. There are some people who who are making an argument that it should be based on traditional African patterns of governance, which is also one useful thing to think about to at least put in the harper. I mean, uh, I always say that I don't know anybody who would march into the the capital of the Asante kingdom in Kumasi, Ghana, and have a coup d'etat. It would not happen. They will march into Accra, Ghana, where the modern state capital is, and have a coup d'etat, but not with a traditional leader. And the reason, probably, is because there are more legitimacy with a traditional leader. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the system will be, but uh, there is a a young man named uh, Tidian Gadio, who is a foreign minister of Senegal, who has uh, created something called um, uh, uh, Citizens Convergent Toward Pan-Africanism. So it's a, it's a continental-wide organization to start dealing with all these minor issues, uh, minor problems, and, and try to resolve them so that when the heads of state meet in July, they will we have thought about all these kinds of issues, but they are, people are thinking about them. Let's take one more question and then we'll move into okay. relax sitting next door for uh, the session. Bob? Well, thank you very much for a stimulating uh, discussion um, from my class of business thank strategy you. students. Thank you. And you raised some very important strategic issues. Um, first, when we talk about strategy, we talk about vision. And clearly this presents a vision as to where the continent of Africa needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, uh, the aspect of how you choose a strategy is kind of looking at, at the conditions and the situations. I come from Jamaica, and we tried something like this back in, as you, you know, sure. probably remember, in 62 mm -hmm. with the Federation of the West Indies, which lasted two years mm -hmm. before it broke up. Um, however, the Europeans tried a different strategy in reaching uh, to the existing European Union, which now has 
25 members. It started just with uh, a small number of three members initially in the European Coal and Steel Committee who, who combined for economic cooperation and then grew little by little. What strikes me as, um, I mean, clearly this is a very long range project. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that it's going to take probably a good lot, bit longer than, than 20 years. But I wonder why there wasn't a, a, a decision or a, a strategy which started with the stronger nations economically cooperating. I would think probably South Africa and uh, the nations that have oil in South Africa working together and then bringing in as their economies grow, much in the same way as the European Union grew, and gradually integrate uh, from the basis of an economic union various, uh, over a period of years to political integration. I think well, that by, by starting with the political integration as the, as the, the, the initial step, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't strike me as a very profitable approach. Mm -hmm. You may be right. I I I, um, I don't know why. I think I think that there's all, also some urgency, at least in the in the uh, the way they have moved. Uh, there was some suggestion, at least uh, actually again a suggestion that was made uh, at Abuja uh, about a year and a half ago. I think by the Libyan delegation that uh, there should be a coalition of the willing and that uh, the coalition of the willing might include just a few states and you might pull, pull other states in as they are capable or willing to do so. Um, and that may be a, a good thing to do. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure what they will decide in July. They have decided already, however, that it has to happen. And uh, Tabo Mbeki of South Africa says, that if it doesn't happen within 20 years, we're in deep trouble in Africa. Um, but we have, to, we, have to, we have to try to pull this off. Because right now, many countries on the continent do trade, trade more with countries outside the continent than they do internal to the continent. I mean, why, why would you, if you live in Congo and someone lives in Zambia right next door, why would you uh, in Congo trade more with the French or with the Belgians than you do with the Zambians. I mean, th this is a problem. And it's only a problem because Zambia was controlled by the British and Congo, uh, one Congo was controlled by the French and the other one's by Belgium. And so they look to France or look to Belgium and Zambia looks to, um, well, used to look to Britain. So it's a, uh, these are big problems. So I think that the uh, coalition of the willing, starting with with the nations that, not necessarily the, the big nations, because the big nations may not be willing yet. But i give give you another story. Uh, Gaddafi says that, that Libya has four million people. There's four million people. He says, but we are a country, we have much more money than we can use. This is one country, one African country has more money than it can use. We would willingly give our money to create this union. The country of Gabon, Gabon has the fourth highest per capita income. No, 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 it's not per capita. It's the fourth highest gross of any nation. Of course, it's not adequately distributed. But because of their oil money, I mean, it's a small country, small population, makes a huge amount of money. So there are some possible, Botswana is another, there are some countries that have great potential, but then there are, there are also 14 nations in Africa that are landlocked, they have no outlet to the sea. So uh, one way to solve that problem, again, is if you say with the United States of Africa, then everybody has an outlet to the sea. So there are many issues that can be resolved this way, but it's going to be hard. Okay, I want to thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Dr.